Folks, you may not recognize that music, but that is the Army theme song. And the reason we're playing that today is we're having a fireside chat with a citizen in our community who has served our country well. You may remember him on these airwaves before. I'm talking about Mel Levy. Mel, welcome to Studio C. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate you coming in. Uh, For folks that don't know or may have heard that Levy name, his mother, uh, Barbara Levy, is running unopposed for what? Gee, she wears three or four hats. What she, is, she does. She's the uh, county assessor, clerk, recorder, and chief uh, registrar of voters. Registrar of voters. Yeah. And she's done a fine job. I know she took over, uh, again, some more responsibility over there. And now she this did. is her first time uh, elected, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah, this is the first time uh, elected. She was appointed uh, just over a year ago yeah. um, at, from the assistant assessor's position. That's great. Well, she's done a wonderful job over there, and I know it's kind of thankless, and she's really busy this time of year, of course. She is, uh, she is. But uh, And Mel's dad, people might know, Arnie's humidor, Arnie Levy. Yes, yeah. He um, uh, retired from McDonald's, actually, after about 40 years, and about two years ago opened up Arnie's humidor over on uh, West 18th Street. Kind of a dream of his. uh, It it, it was, especially, you know, for the last decade or so that he was working at McDonald's, he uh, kind of had that dream of opening a shop and, um, you know, inviting all the all the guys and gals into relax and watch a game and smoke. So. Yeah, it's a, it's. A, I'm I'm not a cigar aficionado, but I, I like the smell of them. I don't know why, and I'm really uh, pleased to see. Seems to have a lot of people come through there. A lot of the politicos. They seem to have a little barbecue or meet there's, and greet over there. It's be kind kind of a happening place to be. It's true. You know, there's a great spot outside to barbecue, and there's a couple of lounges in there. So yeah, it's kind of turned into a great spot to you know have get-togethers and you know folks have had little fundraisers there and everything. So yeah, it's really successful, and I'm glad to see yeah. that you know and it's nice when uh, I, I guess you would consider your dad retired even though he's working he retired he worked at mcdonald's for the abates for many years he, didn't he he did he was over there he was there for over 41 years wow. and uh this this is his retirement although seven days a week doesn't seem all that retired yeah but, uh, well i understand yeah. you're helping out over there a little bit too yeah I, I try and help when i can to give him a give him a night off you know him and my mom can have a, a date night or something oh, so now that's nice. yeah now you have a sister i do have i have one sister she's uh, two years younger than than i am sarah and uh, she actually lives in Virginia uh, and works out there. Now, is that and, Washington, uh, D.C. area? She, she lives uh, just on the outskirts of, of Washington, D.C., across the river. Cool. And, uh, and so she moved out there for grad school. And uh, well, What does she do? Uh, she, she works uh, and does a lot of um, – works with a firm that represents cruise lines. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so she works a lot with cruise lines and um, different legislation that's coming up pertaining to the cruise industry. Did you guys get along well as and, kids? Uh, we did. You know, we went to uh, Our Lady of Mercy School. And I heard that. Now, was that here in Merced? Yes. OLM. Yes, OLM. Uh, and, until uh, eighth grade, and then you went up to Modesto? Right, right. And uh, and we actually lived, where we lived was just down the street, basically, from Our Lady of Mercy. Okay. And so we used to walk there a lot, uh, a lot of times, uh, just the two of us. So, uh, no, we've we've gotten along great since... Uh, since we were little kids, I don't know, she may have a different story. Yeah, to tell, well, but. you know, sibling rivalry. <laughs> I didn't have any brothers and sisters, but boy, I watched some of them practically kill each other. But they're best of friends when they get older. So, <laughs> I'm glad to see that uh, you have a good relationship with your sister. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about you. If people don't remember Mel Levy, they've heard that name. You ran very recently in uh, June, I think the election was for what was a congressional district? Yes. Yeah, I ran for uh, the congressional district uh, House uh, 16 seat. And uh, here in California, so that was uh, Merced, Madera, Fresno, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of well, there were quite a few people in that race. I remember we had you in. There was a Bothello, I believe. There was and, there were, yeah there were six six different candidates in the race, including the incumbent, and uh, wow. of course two two of the six went on. Yeah, and, uh, I've been in that position. So. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a tough one. It's very it's very eye opening running, isn't it? It is. It is. Obviously, that was my first uh, race. And oh, it's a different experience. Would and you, you, would you come away some of the things you came away from uh, running for the, public office? The, the 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 biggest thing, and I guess uh, you know, right off the bat, is you know, folks folks do want answers, and you know, luckily I was willing and able to you know study and research and and learn and you know put my positions out there. But um, you know, the idea that folks just want some thirty second soundbite that is not true, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they they want real answers, especially when you're talking to them face to face, meeting them at their doors, and uh, so that was probably the neatest thing um you know the the other side of running for office is the money side yeah and uh and that's always fundraising and fundraising and and doing that and that's always tough but uh it's hard to ask for money isn't it from people it is it's a it's a skill set you have to learn but the other thing is you know folks are very generous with their money uh when when it's something they believe in and uh and so you have to just articulate that and uh and get them on your side right get 
get them that's to believe. That's true. It's it, and it's it's neat the uh, wide variety and diversity of people you meet. It's it's interesting what certain people's issues are. Some people mm-hmm. have one issue. Some people are more broad based. I really enjoyed meeting people and just talking to them. You had a pretty big district. It encompassed uh, Merced. Uh, Madera. Yeah, it goes goes all the way down to Fresno. Yeah. And uh, you know, for me, it was a it was a great experience. I'd I'd been gone you know, off and on in the military for about 11 years right? and, you know, deploying and then coming back. And so, um, you know, I'd maintained my residency here cause I knew I wanted to come back home eventually. But, right. uh, but for me, it was a great opportunity to come back home. Um, right. Following my, you know, my last deployment was just about a year ago. So, right. you know, I just come home from Afghanistan and what a great opportunity to just meet folks and learn more about the area and, uh, and try and contribute to, to the dialogue. Yeah. And so. when you, and when you say home, you, Obviously, sound uh, sound like a Merced native. Your family's been here over 140 years in the area, so this is truly home. It is, it is, yeah. And and you and you feel invested, like you say, you uh, you did serve our country Mm -hmm. uh, for for many months over in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think you had what three deployments over there. I did, yeah, yeah, two uh, two deployments in Iraq, and then my third one was in Afghanistan. And and we should say that you are a West Point graduate. I am, and and I am very proud to have you in here and. I know it goes without saying, or I will say it. I'm very proud of your service to our country and what you, you did. And and, I, and you know, it's not easy to get into West Point, is it, Mel? It's not. It's not. It's a it's a heck of a process. And actually, I'm I'm kind of living it again. I'm helping different um, uh, different young young adults here and high school kids here um, go through the process for applying really? to academies. And uh, I've been working with a few different students up at uh, my alma mater, Central Catholic High School, Modesto, and cool. and uh, talking with a few different students here in Merced County as well. And, uh, oh, it's a heck of a process. There's Explain it just a little bit. What did you have to go through? I mean, obviously grades and education. Right. You know, the, the normal college application process is, you know, you do well in high school and you apply to that college. Mm-hmm. And the academies are similar in that you apply to the academies, but it's, there's also some added steps. And, and one, of that, one of the big steps is getting a nomination from a, a congressperson or a senator. Wow. And so it's a whole separate application process. Um, that most of them have set up and, and they have committees that kind of review candidates uh, who might might be eligible for a nomination. But uh, but you're doing that at the same time you're applying to the school. And then at the same time, there's the physical and the medical clearances that you have to get to attend the, the academies. And uh, and those can be pretty strict as well. And uh, so it's really kind of this four pronged um you know, push that you have to go through. And the academies, you know, they're not just looking at academics. They, they want to see folks who have leadership potential. They want to see folks who um, are willing to serve in the military, who are willing to deploy uh, and lead soldiers in, in combat. So um, there's, there's really this whole person um, concept that they look at and they want to see the, you know, the entire person and, and what you're about. I imagine there's a lot of people trying to apply for that. There is, uh, you know, especially since uh, September 11th, uh, 2001, um, the academies have been uh, a little more visible. The military Mm -hmm. has been a little more visible. And so they're extremely competitive. And fortunately, they are because the academies do get really good people uh, in there. And uh, and so it's incredible. Uh, You know, for me, it was very humbling going there. And, um, you know, you do really well in high school and then you get to the academy and you realize everybody's done well in high school, right? Every, 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 everyone is incredible that. here. And uh, so you very quickly learn that no matter how good you are at anything, there's always someone better. Yeah. And, uh, and you just kind of work together and get through it. I, th- I think I've, I've, uh, I was at a, a person's house the other day, and he had a baseball pen area set up, and uh, his kid was really good at local sports. But when he moved on to the college level, he realized there was a lot of good local sports <laughs> heroes <laughs> right. in college, and it was a different world for him. But, you know, you bring up a good point. Now, West Point is – for leadership, uh, 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 what would you call it, uh, officers, right? It, it, it is. Uh, you know, th- you graduate from the academies, all the academies, as an officer in, mil- mm-hmm. in the military. Uh, from West Point, you graduate as a second lieutenant in the Army. And that's what they teach you. And, it, and yeah, they teach you leadership right. and how to lead soldiers, uh, how to lead your peers, which is sometimes the most difficult thing, uh, and, uh, and, and really how to analyze problems and make hard decisions. And it starts on day one. Uh, there and uh, and really it continues throughout your entire military career. And you know you mentioned nine eleven and you're a, a lot younger than me, Mel. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing. Uh, well, I won't tell you what I'm pushing, but you're in your twenties or thirties. Uh, Twenty nine, yeah. Twenty nine. Jeez, I was gonna. Uh, so young. Now nine eleven had a big impact on you, didn't it? It, it did. Uh, you know, I think for a lot of folks my age, uh, I, I was a, a junior in high school. It was right at the beginning of my junior year. So uh, for me, it was right at that point where. You know, my friends and I in high school are trying to figure out what do we want to do next? What do we want to be? 
And uh, so as folks are looking at college and looking at um, jobs and careers, uh, 9-11 happened. And so for me, it was a huge impact. Um, it, it really crystallized kind of what I thought I needed to give back to the country. And I, I know it did that for a lot of my friends. In fact, uh, at, at West Point, my class, which, uh, which entered West Point in the summer of 2003, mm-hmm. um, so just shortly after 9-11, kind of while the Iraq War was starting, my class at West Point chose our class crest, uh, which kind of represents the the class, right. and on it we have the twin towers from New York, and Great also uh, an inscription of the Pentagon. And so for us, it was a real motivating factor uh, in serving serving our nation and in, in trying to make things better. You know, when you say serving our nation, I know at that time it seemed like we had a great unity in our nation. We did. And I I think, I don't know if you would agree, I think we've lost some of that. I I think we've lost a lot of it, yeah. It's very disappointing. I know that at the time uh, 9-11 happened, I I guess the the last big event would have been Pearl Harbor. I know that that was brought up, you know, never forget, that day will live in infamy. And I think 9-11 should be just as poignant in our minds, just as forefront and I know that uh, a lot of a lot of folks have kind of lost that emphasis, and you know, we're we're uh, one of the things I think that's frustrating for me, having never served in the military, mm-hmm. um, is watching what's going on over there now in Iraq, and uh, we've talked a little bit about it off the air about you actually served with the Iraqi army, helped train these people Correct. over there. What, what happened, Mel? Well, uh, we, we did work uh, with the Iraqi military. We worked with uh, the Kurdish Peshmerga, uh, mm-hmm. who are currently fighting. And we worked with a lot of militias, right? A lot of kind of local groups protecting their neighborhoods. Because that's and, how the country's structured. There's a lot of clans or, right, it's, I don't know what the right terminology is. But there's, there's a lot of tribes. Tribes. Right. And, and, it, and it's, it, there is a kind of an underlying tribal structure. Um, now, it's not as strong in Iraq as it is in other places, but... Uh, but we worked with a lot of those groups, and the one thing that struck me, you know, not everyone's as well organized, not everyone's as well funded, but one thing that struck me is, you know, these are very courageous people we're talking about. The and Iraqis people. The, 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 the Iraqi people, and, and for the most part, uh, you know, the majority of them want what we want. They want to live in peace, they want to have a steady job, and they want their kids to go to school. I remember this one day, we were clearing a road uh, in Iraq, and um, we found uh, what we thought were some IEDs, right? Some explosive devices on the Improvised road. Improvised explosive devices where they take our shells or some sort of ordnance and turn it into a bomb. Correct, correct. Yeah, and they hide it there for us or for the Iraqis to, to stumble upon. And so we were looking at, at how we were going to remove these from the road so we can continue on. And I remember this Iraqi soldier uh, running up to it and cutting the wire, picking the bomb up and carrying it back to us and saying, where wow. do you want us to put it? <laughs> Not here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, that's, and that's basically what we said, no, yeah. away from us. Yeah. But, but it struck me just the courage to be able to do that. Well, you heard about and, the Kurdish people. You mentioned the Kurd, Kurd, mm-hmm. Kurdish people in, the, I believe, the northern part of Iraq. Correct. Very, very uh, fierce fighters, mm-hmm. uh, proud of that. And again, I think part of it is being recognized by the leadership of Iraq. And that was pro- some of the problems with al-Malachi that we saw, right? It, it, it was. We, we've seen kind of the... You know the Iraqi military dissolving or, or running from um, from these uh, these extremist fighters over there, and I think in large part it was not the soldiers on the ground that had a problem with standing and fighting because I've seen them do that. It was the leadership, um, the the former prime minister uh, Maliki, um, put in guys who were loyal to him. He was trying to solidify his own personal base of power, and it's very hard to get folks to fight for something if your leader isn't willing to do it. And so I think a lot of the military leaders over there. Um, were corrupt, were incompetent, and that's why we saw those forces fall. And with new leadership, I think those forces could fight and will fight because, um, again, I've seen it. I've seen them stand up to, um, to terrorists and to, to bad actors. So, Yeah, I, I think it's just a, a basic human uh, uh, desire to live in peace and not to have to worry about your family. And Absolutely. those folks are no different than us in that respect. They Absolutely. may not have all of the uh, trophies of, of Western civilization, but uh, they, they do have the same basic human feelings. You know, you've mentioned leadership a couple of times in this first segment, and we're going to talk about that when we come back from our break. And you've also mentioned about the tribal aspect of Iraq and Afghanistan. You right. served in both. I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the current challenges we're seeing over there and how you think those, because again, you were on the ground, how you think those can be defeated, if at all. And, and I love your candor, and, and I appreciate appreciate you coming in. So I would encourage folks to stick with us into the second segment of this fireside chat. We have our air pollution control district approved fireplace insert here. So we're not violating any laws, folks. It's a little warm here in studio, but we will be right back after this, these words on KYOS 1480 AM. 
Folks, welcome back to the second segment of our special fireside chat here on KYOS 1480 AM, the voice of the valley, the power of local radio. We like to bring in uh, local people who have an impact on our community, who like to participate and truly care about their community. And we have in studio today Mel Levy, decorated officer of the United States Army who served in Iraq and and Afghanistan, both. Uh, Both of them have been in the news. He was a West Point graduate. He was deployed three times to Iraq and Afghanistan. His family has been here for many years in town, over 140. His mother is the uh, assessor, recorder, slash, got all kinds of hats she wears (laughs) over there, Barbara Levy. Of course, his father has Arnie's Humidor, great place for people to go and, and congregate. But Mel, we were talking a little bit about, before the break, about overcoming uh, some of these obstacles in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're going right. to get to local issues, folks. Don't don't worry. But I have to take the opportunity while we have somebody who's been on the ground, and these things are at the forefront of every Sunday news show. Absolutely, ISIS, ISIL. I don't know what they call them. Uh, uh, you say they're an offshoot of Al Qaeda, basically. They, we they, were fight. You were fighting them. Cor- correct. Uh, so the the group, and I I usually refer to it as ISIL, and the only reason for that is the State Department refers to them like that, and and I always think it's helpful when we kind of use the same terms. Right. right? Um, But this group called the ISIL um, has its origins in the group that we used to call Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, and uh, we used to abbreviate it AQI. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's this group that, you know, I don't know if you remember some of the beheadings and other acts of violence that were taking place in Iraq about 10 years ago. Yes. It's that group. And some of the leaders have been killed and changed out, and and the names have changed. Mm -hmm. But... uh, but the, the group at its core is the same group. And, and so we were fighting them. Um, you know, I personally was facing different cells that, that were under their control in southwest Baghdad in 2008. And this is what we call radical Islam, right? It is. It's it's a it's an extremely radical version of of uh, Islam. It was this this particular group was formed by a, a Jordanian named uh, Zarqawi, and uh, he kind of pledged allegiance to Osama bin Laden in the early stages of the of the Iraq War, and so he kind of kind of branded himself as a group from Al Qaeda. Now, since then, Al Qaeda. Um, kind of the original al-Qaeda, has broken from this group mm-hmm. over differences in ideology and, and some of that things. But, but, uh, but the leaders are guys that kind of cut their teeth fighting Americans, mm-hmm. fighting American soldiers uh, during the Iraq War, fighting Iraqi soldiers during the Iraq War. Um, so this group is, you know, they're combat-hardened, they're, they're veteran fighters, um, they're good at what they do. Um, which is, you know, kind of fight asymmetrically, you know, using these terrorist tactics. Right. And, uh, and it's going to be a, a tough fight to, to beat them, but I think we can do it. Now, you were over on the ground in Iraq. I mean, you saw uh, the practice of the Islam religion. Mm-hmm. People, I think, here in America get a, a feeling that everybody is like this, that, that practices Islam. That's not true, is it? No, not, not at all. Uh, you know, Islam is a is an enormous religion. Right. Obviously, there's there's over a billion adherents right. around the world, and so you know I, I explained it to a lot of folks who have questions about yeah. it. Similar to Christianity, you know, there's different um, sects in Christianity. There's different um, you know kind of um, adherence to it in terms of you know some folks are going to church every day, some mm-hmm. are um, you know eating certain you know meals to, right. to adhere to Christianity, and others are kind of your you know they they might attend mass on. Christmas or Easter, right? Sure. We see that uh, in the Jewish community. It, you have the Hasidic Jews exactly. that are very, uh, you know, adherent to the uh, specific language of the religion. And right. And so it, it's true in any religion. It, it, it is. And and what what I think happens um, is that, you know, the loudest folks get the press mm-hmm. and the most extreme folks get the press. So there's hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world who are uh, peace loving and family oriented. But they don't make the news because it's not interesting. Right. And uh, and so I think what we're seeing are just these extremist elements, and uh, and and certainly they're capturing the press. Well, you you, you uh, commanded ethnically diverse people when you were in Baghdad. Do you think it's possible to win this? Because it's an ideology we're talking about, right? It it is an ideology. What's interesting is that you know we we and again we face this ideology. We face these groups um, over the last ten or so years in Iraq. And what we found is that the majority of folks who, for instance, are fighting for this group right now, for, for ISIL, are probably not the hardcore believers. And what we were able to do so successfully during the surge in Iraq was create cleavages, basically, mm-hmm. gaps between the hardcore believers, which is a small number of extremists who you know, really adhere to this ideology, and kind of the vast majority of their fighters that they enticed with money or mm-hmm. 
you know, different riches. Right. And I think it's possible to do the same now. And it's what it's going to take is good relationships built on the ground with these people, right? To understand what their issues are, whether it's unemployment, whether they feel marginalized within their own society. You're right. But the vast majority of these groups uh, are not extremists, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they are fighting for other reasons. And it's, an, it's a matter of um, being nuanced enough to understand those reasons mm -hmm. and then being focused enough to address that and then go after the kind of unreconcilables, the, the hardcore folks at, at the core and, uh, and with those folks, there's just no, no reasoning with them, is there, Mel? There's not. For the most part, to, to defeat them, you're going to have to kill them. Yeah, it's, it's something that they have that, that thought has to be eliminated. And right. it's like you say, poverty, uh, education, those things just uh, are, are breeding grounds for these types of people because they prey upon uh, those folks. We've made a tremendous investment, you know, folks that would say, gosh, you know, they're, they're not appreciative. But they really are because you've seen it. They, there are folks that are appreciative, and we're just hearing about a small group. Right. Um, you know, you, you're absolutely correct when you you know talk about poverty and joblessness kind of helping breed this. You know, we see it in the States in terms of gang violence, right? A community, and we can no talk about this. Is it? Right, and we no, can talk about it a little segue. later. But, it's a good time but, to talk about it. You know, we, we see it in, in our own community. You know, when, when you have poor areas and folks who feel um, like they're on the fringe of society and they're marginalized, mm -hmm. they're much more likely to turn towards uh, activities and beliefs that, uh, that reinforce that, right? That, that tell them that, you know, they can get what's theirs um, by taking it. And that's what we saw in Iraq. That's what we saw in Afghanistan. But you're absolutely right. The, you know, we would build a school and the mothers and fathers were happy their kids could go to school, right? They were happy to see their daughters being able to go to school, sometimes right. for the first time. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're not all that different. You know, there's, of course, cultural divides to, to reach across. Uh, and that's where it's going to take leadership. I'd, I'd love to see better leadership, more leadership from the White House mm -hmm. and from the higher levels of the administration on the problem in Iraq and Afghanistan. How do you feel as a warrior, as a soldier, when you see our president currently try to distance himself, this isn't a war, it's just an air campaign, don't you think we need to call it what it really is? Ab absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I said earlier that, um, you know, I think it's helpful when we all use the same terminology. And that's because when we're going to talk about an issue, uh, to make sure everyone's on the same page, you have to call it what it is. And, and I do not believe that ISIL will be defeated without men and women on the ground with guns in Which their hands. Which is what you did. R correct. And now I don't know if those men and women are going to be Americans. I don't know if they're going to be Iraqis, Syrians, uh, Kurdish folks. But the fact of the matter is these hardcore elements of ISIL will not be defeated except by people on the ground with guns. Now, we can help with air power, but it only goes so far. Yeah. And it's really going to take President Obama and his um, key advisors engaging with uh, the new prime minister of Iraq, Al-Abadi, mm -hmm. uh, and in a, in a way that he didn't do with Prime Minister Maliki. And that, that I think that's probably my greatest frustration over the last several years in our policy towards Iraq is the distance that President Obama put between himself and the entire peace process. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't willing to engage with his counterparts, and it showed them that he wasn't invested in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, President Bush, for all of his faults, did engage with right. Prime Minister Maliki, and he, he took it upon himself to help mentor other leaders around the world. And, uh, and I'd like to see President Obama do some of that because he is failing right now. I'd like to see some leadership, I think, is what you're saying. Absolutely. And we've used that term several times. And when we send young men into harm's way and they don't come back, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult when you don't have leadership that realizes what those sacrifices are. And I know you right. saw those sacrifices firsthand. One of the things we're going to talk about and we're going to finish up on the national scene is Afghanistan. You were okay. over there too. Right. Karzai just left. Didn't even thank America for what they did. Right. If he would have gone outside of Kabul, he would have been uh, <laughs> not in good shape. And he didn't seem to appreciate. I hope the same thing doesn't happen there. Do you think we should be leaving trips, troops in Af Afghanistan to make sure the same thing doesn't happen that's happened in Iraq? I, I do think we should. Uh, uh, fortunately, we, uh, we just signed an agreement with the new Afghan president, uh, Ashraf Ghani, um, to leave a residual force there. I'm not positive that it's big enough, but it's at least a start. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, we, we've spent a lot of treasure and most importantly, a lot of blood uh, in both those countries, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I lost soldiers and friends over there. And uh, and so I hope that we, you know, they, they kind of say stay the course. I hope we stay the course mm -hmm. um, because we are on the right track. It's hard work. It yeah. takes a long time. 
And, uh, and the key thing, and again, I go back to President Obama and his leadership, the key thing is he must engage this new Afghan president. You know, what's, what's terrible is for the last year and a half or so of the Karzai administration, mm-hmm. uh, President Obama spoke with him maybe once or twice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, we have tens of thousands of American troops. They're our closest ally uh, over there in, in that fight. Mm-hmm. And our president is barely speaking with their leader. Yeah. I, can you imagine FDR and Churchill not speaking during World War II? Right. No, I, I can't. You know, it's it, it. Of course, the way to win these fights is to have close cooperation. And the mm-hmm. president, our president, I don't think has done a good job of building those relationships. And so I see President uh, Hamid Karzai leaving office and kind of taking jabs at Americans, and it's disappointing. But I think, huh, what could our leader have done to change that perception? Yeah. Well, I know we could talk about. It's a fascinating subject to me, folks, and I don't mean to. Uh, uh, but again, while we have Mel in here, I just think his insights are, are very uh, uh, enlightening Thank you. because he was on the ground. And, and it, it's something that concerns me. Again, I've never served, but uh, again, these, the, uh, the blood that we lost over there and to watch what's going on. And, and I tell you, when it hits these shores again, if there's another 9-11, again, we can't forget. We can't forget why we were over there. Absolutely. Uh, that we, we hear that we're war weary. Well, let me tell you what, if we have another 9-11 here, we will not be war weary. And I think we always need to be vigilant. We always need to realize that they throw rocks at the lead dog, folks, and the United States of America is the lead dog on the block. You know, let's talk a little bit about local issues. You wrote a very nice editorial in the Merced County Times, uh, the feel-good paper of Merced, we call it. <laughs> and your editorial was uh, quite biting. Uh, the name of it was A Failing Community. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Well, uh, you know, I was kind of motivated to write this. Uh, having seen the community and observed the community for uh, for the last year or so, you know, like I mentioned, I I got out of the military, I moved back home here, and then I traveled throughout the area uh, during my campaign, and then uh, you know now I'm living and working and and uh, and kind of amongst this. And so what I was seeing was a community that just didn't seem to be able to get off the mat. What was it? The same community you left when you came back? It wasn't, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I think obviously we went through a recession here, um, but in a lot of ways, the community I remember, at least when I when I left, was one we had our challenges. We had our challenges with gang violence. We had our challenges with with crime and, and poverty. But it was a community that was at least on the way up, or was at least managing. And uh, We're holding our own. I agree with that. Right. And and you know I I think about all the different companies that were around when I was a kid, right? Whether it was Farmers Insurance or the yes. Ragu Plant or yeah. all these different areas, all these different employers that are now gone, even as our population has grown. And so I wanted to know why. Why was this happening? And fortunately, at the same time I was thinking these questions, uh, the Census Bureau was releasing its, its annual numbers on uh, poverty and income throughout the United States. And so mm-hmm. I was able to kind of bounce my own observations of the community with these numbers. And the numbers for our community were just staggering. They dismal. were unbelievable. They were disgusting. Yeah, very dismal. Um, I, I know when you talk about poverty, we hear that California made the list, one of the most impoverished states. Right. When you look at 58 counties, we're not doing so hot. No, no. You know, our, our county our, our, our county poverty is over 25%. So over one in four people inside this county are, uh, are in poverty. And I, yeah, I wrote in this, in this op-ed piece that uh, Mississippi, which had the highest poverty rate of any state in the union, had a, a poverty rate of 24%. So yeah. we're worse than the worst state. We're worse than Mississippi, yeah. and uh, and obviously I don't think that's acceptable. And I think that the real problem when we look at addressing it um, is leaders not understanding the root causes. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put words in your mouth. Lack of leadership. Absolutely. Uh, I I always go back to to leadership. I I went to a leadership school. I was a leader in the military. I served under great leaders in the military. And I firmly believe that darn near any problem can be solved with good leadership. And and what we're seeing in this community are leaders grasping for answers, but not coming up with any. And, and what we're, we're defaulting to, I think, is um, road projects that aren't well thought out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're looking for any type of business to come in here. You know, we, I, I hear folks around Merced all the time talking about why we can't be more like Turlock. Mm. You know, why, why, why we can't have shopping like Turlock on Monte Vista. And in the article, I, I kind of address that, that our income is so low. Yeah. It's, it's about $25,000 per year lower uh, per household um, than Turlock. And so if you are an employer, if you are a business, if you're um, a shopping center you know, um, that, that wants to come in, you're not going to go to Merced because we have $25,000 a year less to spend. 
and uh, and that's the root cause. It's it's the income and the education levels, and that's what we need to focus on is is raising those education levels, not building new roads. Yeah, I agree with you. And and uh, if people were listening to our earlier segments, the same problem happened overseas uh, in in those countries we talked about. Education, income, forces people into paths that. Well, they don't have any opportunity, they don't have any hope. And we see that here in our own community. What would be some of, obviously, the Walmart distribution center was a tremendous loss to our community. Right. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned kind of my overseas experience. And in large part, um, the conclusions I've reached about Merced and, and you know, other areas of, of our home here um, are influenced by what I saw overseas. And, you know, each community um, kind of resides on the development spectrum somewhere. And if you think about a community like San Jose in your Silicon Valley, they're very well developed, and their yeah. income is high, and their education mm-hmm. levels are high. They're very, they're very far to the right on the development spectrum. And if you think of a place like Baghdad, where I lived for, for a while, mm-hmm. they're very low on the development spectrum, far to the left, right? Uh, Merced, I think, is farther to the left on the development spectrum than our leaders and a lot of people here think. And that's, that's why I wrote the article. That's why I put the numbers out for why our income is so low and why our poverty is so high. Right. Because I think we're further to the left on this development spectrum. And so when, when you're looking at addressing it, you have to go back to the core reasons that it's like this. And the core reason is crime and education. Um, countywide, our, our rate for 25-year-olds and higher, right? So 25-year-olds and, and older um, who, have a college, who have a high school degree is under 68%. Which basically means that almost one third of the county doesn't have a high school diploma. That's and that's hard to attract employers, like you said. It's, not only people that you don't have the money to spend, it, you can't even hire them. Exactly. You know, I, I I've talked to a few folks who worked out at the AT and T call center. Yes, and, loss of over five hundred job folks. Oh, t- terrible! And one of the reasons that AT and T told those employees in meetings before they left, they told those employees that they were they had to close was due to some of the education levels and some of the discipline problems they were having with the workforce. And obviously, it wasn't everyone out there. A few bad apples oh. always ruin it. Right. But if empl- if we're losing employers because our workforce isn't competitive, mm-hmm. that's a problem. And that's a problem that's not going to be addressed with uh, a downtown double tax and an extra parade. It's a problem that's not going to be addressed with a new road project. Uh, oh, you're talking about Parsons Avenue? <laughs> ab- absolutely. <laughs> you know, one, one of the things that I think a lot of the local leaders and the city council and, and the mayor and other folks look at is, you know, they can show tangible, concrete evidence that they're working if we have a road project. You know, Mel, I'm going to have to, I, I totally lost track of this <laughs> clock up here. Folks, I want you to stick with us into the final segment. We're going to pick up that Parsons okay. issue. It's such a fascinating conversation. I lost track of the clock, but you're going to hear it all. We'll be right back on KYOS 1480 AM. <laughs> Folks, welcome back to the uh, third and final segment. It's going to be a little short one here on our special fireside chat here at KYOS Studio C, 1480 AM. We have in studio Mel Levy. Fascinating guest he uh was 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 so captivating i went over in the last segments so like i say this segment's gonna be about 13 minutes mel thanks again for oh, coming in it. thank you you know we were talking about issues in the city uh some of the lack of leadership some right. of the directions were headed that uh you know grasping at straws and you mentioned parsons avenue and i think you mentioned that in your op-ed piece I about that I, I know one of the things this has been bandied about since 1950 uh, some of the council members are still confused they don't know which way to go <laughs> right. what's your take on parsons avenue mel living here in merced P- Parsons Avenue, and I actually grew up, uh, my, my parents' house was about three blocks from, from Parsons Avenue, so uh, you know I used to ride my bike along the street, and this idea that we're going to put all these improvements into Parsons Avenue was first started in the 50s, like you said. It's a completely outdated project. Right. It needs to be scrapped without spending and wasting any money on a study to see if it should be scrapped. Uh, our, our leaders should be able to use some analytical thinking and some common sense to determine that a plan from 1959 no longer fits. Right. And, uh, and and again, the idea that we're going to spend on road projects and that's somehow going to make employers more likely to come here is just the most off-base thing I think I've ever heard. So what we need to address are the core issues. The core issues are crime and public safety. Uh, we need to get our police force out there aggressively fighting crime, right. preventing our kids from joining gangs. Yeah. Uh, because when a, when, a, when a kid joins a gang, when a young person joins a gang, it then prevents them from usually attending college, mm-hmm. usually graduating high school. And, you know, I already talked a little bit about some of our low education levels. That's the ultimate reason why we don't have uh, employers coming here and and we don't have um, things moving forward. I I read an interesting article uh, not too long ago, and it talked about education levels and and kind of corresponding income. And the study basically determined that 
for every 10% of a population that has a college degree, uh, the average income in the area for everyone, not just those with college degrees, for everyone, goes up about $8,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And if you look at communities in the Silicon Valley and kind of compare them to the, the Central Valley, it, it holds true that right. that education level um, impacts the incomes of everybody. Right. And so, you know, if we could keep folks with an education in this area, the income for everyone in the area would go up. And you're only going to do that from within. Right. It, we, we can't just lure people into Merced anymore. Um, you, you have to get our students graduating from high school, uh, attending schools like UC Merced, uh, and, uh, and then staying in the community. Right. And it has nothing to do with a road out to the UC. Yeah. It has nothing to do with, with any of that. It has everything to do with teachers keeping students in the classroom and police officers keeping students off the street. I'm sure you've seen it, your own friends. I know I saw it in my peer group. Everybody right. left. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody left. I mean, you had a few that stayed. Right. And people trickle back. I trickled back. <laughs> and you trickled back. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. And, and you feel invested in the community. Like, say, you yeah. come back and you see these things like, what happened? Where are we going? You, you know, uh, one of the interesting, when you say research, you heard on Parsons Avenue that the reason we're doing Parsons is there's a mile between M, G, and R. <laughs> and that's not really true, is it? You know, I, I heard that. And actually, I heard it on your on your show. Yeah. And it, it prompted me to go for a drive. And, uh, and so I, I went for a drive down Olive. And measured the streets. Yeah. And they're not a mile apart. Yeah. And, uh, you know, G, G to uh, M is about half a mile. Yeah. M to R is about half a mile. I say, that's a long mile for me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so they're not. And, and again, I think it just speaks to, uh, you know, the, the, some of the city council members were throwing that figure out there. And it speaks to the lack of research they were doing on the issue. Right. So if you don't even know how far the streets are apart, you know, why are you speaking about developing these streets for, uh, for the future? Um, you know, one, one thing that, that uh, they need to do before they, you know, open their mouths and, and expose that their ideas is do the research, learn well, about this. Well, you brought up a comment about uh, maybe they rely a little too much on city staff. I, I, I think in a lot of ways um, they do. And, uh, you know, I, I had some experience in the military on this because I served as both the leader of an organization at times and at other times I served as a staff member mm -hmm. on organizations advising the commander. And staff are fantastic people for the most part. Right. But they're advisors to right. the leaders, and the leaders need to make the decisions. The leaders need to set the, uh, the agenda for what their staff are doing. And I think in a lot of cases, um, staffers in this community, um, legal advisors in this community are the ones who are setting the agenda, mm -hmm. and the leaders aren't making the hard decisions. And they're just taking it carte blanche without any sort of uh, uh, vetting or you know, sifting the wheat from the chaff, if you will, right. or coming up with their own ideas about how they feel about things. Right. And like you say, as a leader... Uh, when you uh, got reports from your subordinates, uh, you obviously just didn't take that at face value. Absolutely, you know, there's, you know, it's it's not just a matter of of kind of taking it in and and swallowing it. You you've got to ask hard questions, and you've got to uh, make sure that um, you know the numbers that they're handing you, uh, or the reports they're handing you, uh, are reflective of the questions you have and and of the the ideas that you have. So, um, no, I think you know, with good leadership, we could certainly start to turn this community around. One of the things I talked about in this article was yes. it, it took us about three decades, I think, uh, to get to this point. And Good if, point. And it doesn't happen overnight, it, does it? It, no. it doesn't happen overnight. And I think it's going to take about three decades to, to turn, us, turn it around. But you have to start. And you have to start somewhere. And, uh, and so I think now is as good a time as any. And uh, with, with some good leaders and aggressive leaders, not just at the city level, it's going to be education leaders, law enforcement leaders, um, partnering with business leaders in the community. Uh, I think with that, we could start to turn it around yeah. and uh, we could start to, um, you know, raise the education levels in the community. And like I said, that eventually is going to raise the income levels here. Well, I think retention is a big deal. And, you know, what you were doing, uh, you mentioned in the first segment about helping uh, future candidates to West Point, mentoring, right. if you will. And this is really where the people from our community need to help the upcoming generation. Absolutely. Uh, make them feel welcome and wanting to stay here. Like you say, Campus Parkway is not the end all. It's what's on the side of that road. What's going to happen? Who's going to be driving down it daily? Exactly. Not just getting the heck out of Dodge. Camp Campus Parkway is no good if local Merced kids right. aren't 
aren't using it to drive to the UC. Yeah. Do you, do you have any feelings on, you know, Castle has been a big deal out there, you know, the right. old Air Force Base. I'm sure you've uh, seen a realignment and things in the military. What do you think maybe some of the answers out there are? I mean, should we bulldoze it or, <laughs> you know, the space shuttle's not flying anymore. What do we do with it? Right. You know, I, I, I'm on the side now. Well, I'll tell you. So I'll kind of tell you where I came from on this issue. Um, when I first moved back here and, and kind of came home, I thought, boy, Castle's such a, an amazing asset with this runway and some of the other facilities. You know, we should be trying to entice companies to, to come here and, and, and doing that. Having gotten more familiar with the area out there, having gotten more familiar with the story of Castle over the last 20 years, uh, I now come down on the side that I think it's probably not a bad idea to just bulldoze the areas that aren't in use and, uh, and, and kind of move on past yeah. the idea of Castle. Um, the facilities out there are so obsolete. Are. Uh, the facilities that haven't been reused especially are so obsolete. You know, you're, you're, when, when we talk about enticing companies, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is just trap them out there mm -hmm. because, <laughs> trap, be, be, good... because, because the facilities aren't good enough to, to use. I was actually, I was just in Monterey over the weekend, oh. and I drove through the old Fort Ord. Okay. And uh, so Fort Ord was a, a huge base, Army base, that Army was out base, in Mon yeah. Monterey. And it closed at about the same time that Castle did. And at the time, the Monterey area and the community leaders came together and kind of came up with a plan for how they were going to reuse um, Fort Ord. And they've done a fantastic, fantastic job at reusing that base. And um, most of CSU Monterey is now housed on it. There's, I saw just this weekend, there was um, a new shopping center area uh, with Kohl's and all sorts of other stores right. um, sitting there on the old Fort Ord. They've done a great job, but the key with them was they didn't wait. They jumped on it in the mid-90s and got after it. We waited, and unfortunately yeah. that was a mistake. But we have to acknowledge the mistake now and I think just move on. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And it is, you know, so disappointing. I mean, thank goodness some good things have come along like UC Merced. And right. Of course, Merced College is a very strong institution. And, and Absolutely. Gives, and, you know, not, and not to put everything on, uh, on higher education, but both the vocations are, are very important here. Uh, farming, agriculture is huge in our community. Right. Of course, at the state level, we have cutting of uh, FFA. I've talked to another guest on another show that I thought the FFA funding was secure now forever. No, it's a year-by-year -year thing. Right. So these challenges are going to come up every basically every fiscal uh, quarter or whatever it's, the periods are fighting for what we can get and like you say if we don't raise the level of the uh, the the water here in this town we're we're, we're going to be down at the bottom it, it's true well, um what what other things you know we're, we're getting close to time because i went a little long on that last segment but right. what what things do you see what what do you want to do here in in town what would you like to uh, uh do with your time what, what's mel levy's plan <laughs> well you know for for now it's it's nice being close to my parents and yeah. close to family and uh kind of helping my dad out and, and doing things like that um you know, and, and also kind of studying these issues here and, and yeah. trying to add, you know, even in a, in a small way, trying to add something to the dialogue here. And, and that's why I am focused a little bit on this, these ideas of education. And like you said, it's not just higher education. Right. Our problem in this county and what we need to be focusing on is getting folks through high school. Right. Get them through high school. I, I had a, um, a little story about um, former Secretary of State Colin Powell yes. and, uh, that, that I, was, I told. And he was in the Army after Vietnam when the Army was reforming. And one of the new requirements that they put in, in the, into the Army in the 70s was everyone coming in had to have a high school diploma. Okay. And he used to say that not only were high school graduates more trainable, better for jobs, but it showed that they didn't quit. They didn't quit high school. Good point. And I think as a community right now, we're quitting uh, and we're quitting on our kids. And so we need to get everyone through high school to show that we don't quit. And that's the first step in, uh, in getting some better jobs. Well, I know I didn't become really politically involved until it affected me. You know, it's kind of that saying, they came from my neighbor, I didn't say anything. They <laughs> came, you know, when, it, when something affected me, man, there was nobody to stand up. And right. so I stood up and I think you're kind of a voice there too, hopefully not a lone voice. And it takes people like yourself that are interested in the community, people that have a worldview, a, a, a broader view, if you will, that can go out and, and come back and bring their thoughts and apply them here locally. Because as we know, everything's local, not just politics. Absolutely. And the problems that you talked about that happened in, in 
Afghanistan or Iraq or other areas of the globe happen right here in our very own community. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not call them Al-Qaeda Al or ISIL. We may call them Norteño or Sareño or, or the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, some other gang name. And, and it's just as insidious. It's right. just as bad. We had a murder here uh, on our streets last week here uh, by the Catholic Church on 11th and M. And, and so it, it does affect us all. And, and we really de need to have the one word that we've talked about over and over is leadership. Absolutely. You know, Mel, and I, I really would encourage people if they want to talk to Mel and, and get to know him to stop by Arnie's Humidor over there. Let's give a shameless plug. It's on 18th <laughs> it's, and it's a, it's R, it's right? It's 1036 West 18th. 1036 West 18th Street. And again, I think Mel's over there a couple days a week. I tried I to get him in here and he, he says, <laughs> hey, man, I got to work. I'm like, really? <laughs> You know, but uh, that's good. And, and again, I would encourage people to, uh, to go over and, and talk to Mel. And hopefully you'll come in again. I really, Thank really you. hope I you do. And I, and I can't say enough, and I, I'm sure the people listening to this show uh, would echo uh, my appreciation and their appreciation for your service to this country Thank and you. to the citizens of this country. You know, when you're sleeping in your bed, wherever it may be here in this town, and you lay your head down, there's people over in other parts of the world that are laying down their life for our safety and our freedom. And I, I know that uh, voting is very uh, uh, important to you, and I'm sure Absolutely. you would encourage people in this next election to get out because sure. it's a, a hard-fought right. We try to bring it to other people. Some people don't appreciate what we have, and I know you do. Yes. And I, I know people got that uh, just by listening to you. So again, thank you coming uh, for coming into the special fireside chat. Thanks for having chat. me. I appreciate it.